Hey everybody, welcome to Do You Believe on Paranormal Zone TV. Thanks everyone for joining me tonight. Now tonight, uh, oh please, if you haven't done so, would you please subscribe to my channel? I'd really appreciate it. And tonight I have a wonderful guest with me, uh, Linda Godfrey, who is an author. And I, we are going to talk a little bit about her new book that's out. She's written many books and she's also a monster hunter. But Linda, what I would like is, would you please uh, give the viewers some information about yourself, please? Sure. Well, I'm uh, a former newspaper reporter and art educator, and I'm still an artist and illustrator, um, but I've been searching for unknown creatures, and I'm sorry, my um, radio just... <laughs> My radio just went on, and I'm going to have to try and uh, find it find it here. Oh, yeah, you better turn the sound off. There we go. Okay. I got it off. Yep. Sorry about that. That's okay. If you can hear it in the background, I apologize. I, of course, had my computer tuned to your show, so <laughs> <laughs> I realized it was going to go on by itself. Anyway, um, yes, I was a newspaper reporter 22 years ago when I happened upon the story of the Beast of Bray Road, um, a creature that looked like what people were calling a werewolf in my own hometown of Elkhorn, Wisconsin. It went national in several weeks, and ever since then, 22 years later, I'm still getting reports of not just that werewolf-like creature, but other sorts of scary things, too, from all over the world and uh, the Americas. And... I wanted to write a book, this, this is my 15th published nonfiction book, that kind of gave people an idea of how many different types of creatures ordinary, earnest, honest citizens are saying that they see and encounter. Um, many of these encounters are unexplainable. Often there's no proof other than just the uh, witness's testimony. And if there were only a few people saying this kind of thing, it would be very easy to dismiss it. But when you've got so many hundreds of reports, and it's not just me, there are lots of other great investigators who are collecting large amounts of um, reports of encounters with flying creatures, um, gargoyle-looking things, unusual, upright beings of every stripe and shade, aliens, uh, lizard people, you name it, people are reporting these. And perhaps because of the internet and the fact that um, there are now sites where it's easy to access this sort of information and that you can um, easily report without having to, like they did 22 years ago, they had to find the newspaper snail mail address and write me, you know, which took a lot more effort. Now everybody's got Facebook and email and um, Twitter and all, all kinds of social media to help in it. Yeah. So um, maybe that's why it's, it's such a widespread thing. But I'm still plugging away at it here <laughs> after 22 years and uh, living in southeastern Wisconsin with my husband, my monster dog. And I guess you could call, you could call me, in a metaphorical sense, a monster hunter. I'm not literally out there with a rifle trying to shoot anything. No, but you do enemies. investigate them. <laughs> But you do investigate I, I them. Do in, right. I do investigate. Yep, I do investigate. I do go out in the field. In fact, I was out all afternoon, as a matter of fact, um, investigating both a, a follow-up on a fairly recent mammal sighting and um, just doing some searching in the woods where I've had Bigfoot reports. Okay. So tonight, Linda, um, we're, going to t we're going to talk about Monsters by Air. And it's mm -hmm. coming from your new book, American Monsters. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, how about tonight, We, f our first subject, we talk about the Jersey Devil. Now, Linda, the Jersey Devil, oh my gosh, there's so many different stories about how the Jersey Devil started. Yeah, this is an example where the story is as much of a monster as the creature. <laughs> you know, it just grows and grows and it's got all these different facets, and, um, you know, it's got ancient legend, it's got modern sightings. It's one of the best-known monster stories in the United States, I believe. 
And the weird, the weird thing about it, in my mind, is that you know, it it doesn't. It certainly doesn't look like any kind of known animal. It's a weird mixture. And in my book, I compared it to this puzzle that my little grandson has, where it's got um, heads of different animals, bodies of different animals, feet, and then you put them together, and you can make all these crazy-looking combinations. And that sort of what what it what it seems like might have happened to the Jersey Devil. Now. Was, um, now the Pardon? the first sightings um, started in what in nineteen oh nine. Um, they, something like that. There's actually an older legend. Um, it had a it had a real wild spree in nineteen oh nine, um, but it was already known. And it, it isn't it isn't necessarily true that these two things are linked, but. This was way back in 1735, which is, you know, almost uh, two centuries earlier. The Pine Barrens had this legend of a woman named Deborah or Jane Leeds whose 13th child was a monster and killed the family when it was born, ran into the Pine Barrens and hid out, made screeches, would steal livestock, um, it was also known as the Phantom of the Pines. And then in 1909, this rampage of strange killings began. And right away, people thought of that old legend, of the legend of the pines. Oh, and when do you mean killings? They were killing animals, people? Um, yeah, there, there were lots of, uh, there were animals found dead. Um, it was killing pets and... I'm, I'm thinking that um, most of the killings were, were farm animals and, and that sort of thing, or pets. But it was it was very strange looking because um, it had it, it resembled partly a kangaroo, yet it had wings. It left footprints like hooves, and then it had the head of a dog and a fork tail kind of like a reptile and then on its front feet it had claws and in 1909 it supposedly was seen in 30 different New Jersey communities Mm -hmm. in mid-January which is a time when usually isn't a great time of year for monsters of any type but in Haddon Heights for instance in New Jersey it ran past a city trolley and all the passengers on the trolley saw it and said it looked like a kangaroo with wings and police were hunting this with bloodhounds in Camden. A civilian group of eyewitnesses saw it, along with a police officer who also observed it drinking from a horse trough. And he actually fired his gun at it. Oh, my God. But either he missed or it didn't um, phase the creature. Sometimes that happens with these kinds of monsters. The same thing happened in Bristol, Pennsylvania, and also in that city, uh, the firefighters got out their pressurized water hoses uh-huh. and tried to, um, you know, intimidate it that way, but it still got away. So, and after night, pardon, oh, uh, oh no. I was just going to say, it yeah. seemed to disappear back into the Pine Barrens after that spree. Okay, so tell the viewers what the local legend is about how the Jersey Devil came about. Well, that would be... Um, what I was mentioning earlier about the woman named uh, Deborah or Jane Leeds, who supposedly gave birth, it was the 13th child, they were very poor, supposedly she cursed the child, and that's why it was born as a monster, and escaped into the woods after killing its own family. So that was that was the origin, supposedly, of the, the Jersey Devil, and then when something came out that people couldn't identify in 1909, they linked it back to the idea of this very old legend from the 1700s. Oh, they did link it back. Now, uh, from what I understand that uh, they did have in the 1900s, they did have a few um, reports that they still have today, not many, but they do have, and those records are still, they still have those records? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, there have been, there was a really uh, famous uh, sighting in 1993 um, 
that it was documented by Lauren Coleman, a well-known cryptozoologist, mm. where an off-duty summer park ranger in 1995 was driving through the Wharton State Forest along the uh, Malika River when he ran into this very, very strange creature that he saw come out of the woods, move into the roadway, and it actually blocked the roadway so that this park ranger had to stop his car in order not to hit it. And at first he saw it, thought it was a deer, but then it stood upright, and he saw it was covered in dark matted fur, was six feet tall, had a deer-like head, its eyes glowed red, which is a typical monster color for eyes, and it moved strangely. It moved in a way he thought was robotic. Uh-huh. Um, it, he did not see any forelimbs on it, um, but he also didn't see the bat-like wings that it was supposed to have had in 1909. Oh. So it was just a, a really, really strange, um, strange sort of thing. But this was a park ranger who certainly knew the ordinary animals and should have been able to identify a deer or some other ordinary creature just yeah. standing upright. Okay, now it's also said that the Jersey Devil seems to appear before a conflict or a war. Well, that could be. A lot of these creatures are known to be, um, or, or are thought of as, rather would be the better way to put it, um, harbingers of doom, you know, that, that foretell that sort of thing. And, it, you know, it's possible. I don't know that... Um, you could really bear that out if you went, and maybe there there is somebody who has matched every war up to sightings of the Jersey Devil. Um, I haven't seen it myself, so I so I wouldn't know. But um, that would mean it would have to have appeared before the Civil War. And, That's what they said. Yeah, the so, Civil War, the Spanish American, World War mm-hmm. One, uh, World War Two. Um, that could very well be sure. Uh, I just, I'm sorry, I just don't, I don't have that in my research. Oh, okay, so, no, 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 no um, problem. So I can't confirm it, but, but yeah, that, a lot of the, it does, that does ring very true with um, many other instances where these strange creatures are, seem to show up just before things go very badly in the world, in one way or another. Mm-hmm. Now, um, this Jersey Devil there, the sightings still continue today. How many, how frequent are the reports of the Jersey Devil? Well, it's something that isn't always reported to me, so um, that's something that I, I really could not answer very well. Um, I think that they're occasionally seen, and my friends who have the uh, Weird New Jersey, started the Weird New Jersey site will, um, Mark, and, Mark Moran and Mark Skirman, who also did the Weird U.S. series, but you can go to uh, weirdnewjersey.com is a good place if you want to keep up on, on sightings. So, um, yeah, I'm sorry, I, I don't have that particular statistic for you. Oh, that's okay, Linda. Now, um, uh, so the Jersey Devil... Um, the description that people, the eyewitness descriptions when they get these reports, are they always all the same? They have the same description of the devil, the Jersey Devil? Um, they seemed to be pretty much the same when there was that big flap in 1909. But you'll notice that the description those people gave in 1909 sound a little different than, for instance, the park ranger John Irwin gave in 1993. And this, for instance, it, in the original sightings in 1909, it had bat wings, it had large ears that stood up. Um, it seemed that it had front limbs, whereas in the later sightings, uh, it was missing these things. Oh, really? And that, that's pretty common, you know, because um, usually there's just no way to, absent photographs or, or other sorts of, of uh, documentation, um, it's, it's just really hard for people, I think, to see, even if the creature is exactly the same in each instance, the viewing conditions and distances and perhaps eyesight of the witness are all going to vary, so I don't think it's completely unusual that 
some people would that there would be minor variations in describing its appearance um, from place to place. So, um, besides having the sightings, are there any other reports of uh, few, uh, the killings? Uh, any more of animals being killed uh, in that area? I don't think that there's anything like the 1909 flap. Um, there may be occasional depredations that people might blame upon it, but I'm not sure there's anything in very recent times that could be directly linked. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, well, why don't we move on then to the Mothman? This is my favorite subject. I absolutely love the Mothman. So why don't we talk about the moth? Why don't you talk about the Mothman, Linda? So, okay, okay. Well, actually, the go ahead. The first signing was what nineteen November of nineteen sixty six. Um, well, it was the early to mid sixties um, that this began happening, and um, I, I think it may go back all the way to nineteen sixty one. And it says, uh, you know, according to my book, the earliest that I could find was in 1961 on West Virginia State Route 2 in the Chief Cornstalk Wildlife Management Area. And this was a little bit south of the actual city of, of Point Pleasant. And it was a father and daughter who were driving through late one evening um, when they saw something sitting on the center line of the highway. And it looked somewhat human to them, mm -hmm. but... As they drove closer, the thing snapped out a pair of wings that were so wide, and this is a very common description of these lar large flying things, that they touched either side of the road. And they thought that they were going to hit it, but instead it sailed straight up in the air and vanished into the night. And this is, again, um, these humanoid creatures that are seen with bat-like or leathery wings, that's actually a fairly often reported action that the creature will take when it's seen. Mm. And, and, and the description on this one, what's the description then? They all, this one also has red eyes, right? Uh, of the Mothman? The Mothman is usually described yeah, as a um, largish human, humanoid or human-shaped creature with very large bat-like wings that can sometimes be wrapped around itself, you know, almost like a cape or like, cape or like uh, the way that you see bats wrap yeah. their wings around themselves. Um, it's said they have very uh, brightly glowing red eyes, often very large. Um, a lot of people who describe the Mothman said it didn't really have any visible neck. It was just sort of like the... The head and the body were joined and were sort of furry. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it flew around, um, was sometimes seven feet tall. Um, they usually couldn't make out any other features other than those glowing red eyes. And uh, some people said that the wingspan was smaller, maybe six feet tall. It wasn't always described as a 20-foot a wide um uh, wingspan. And the interesting thing is that the late Fordian researcher John Keel was on the job there for years right. going to interview hundreds of people and he also, what he noticed was that it wasn't just creature sightings. People were also having a lot of sightings of UFOs in the area at the same time. And he began to think, um, you know, by the time that he um, finally stopped researching these things that perhaps there was some underlying phenomenon that linked the Mothman to these UFOs to um, uh, strange electromagnetic anomalies that were happening. Television sets were burning out in people's homes. Um, telephones were acting weirdly. There were strange um, dark-suited uh, men walking around kind of harassing people, the yeah. men in black, we might know them. And uh, Keel also reported that there were mutilated dogs and farm animals, um, which, again, is very reminiscent of the, of the Jersey Devil. Um, now, this, this, this was happening in Point Pleasant, right? I'm 
sorry, your uh, oh. voice dropped out. I didn't quite oh, hear. Oh, I'm sorry. This was all happening uh, in Point. This was all happening in Point Pleasant, West Virginia. In or near it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, um, there was. Um, they had several witnesses, and I believe the first one in 1966 was uh, Linda Scar Scarbarrel. Was that Scarberry, her name? Mm -hmm. Scarberry, right? And um, and she ha she had a sketch of the um, of the uh, uh, of the uh, Mothman, and I have a sketch that mm -hmm. she. And that was done in uh, in 1966 of what she saw. There was uh, four of them. Well, there were there were four people in the car when she right. saw it. Is that what you mean? Yes. Right. Yeah. She was she was with um, her husband, and then there's another couple in the back seat. They were they were very young at the time, though. Um, Steve and Mary Mallett were the other couple, and. There was a former military munitions facility right on the outside of Point Pleasant, Point Pleasant that everybody called it the TNT bunker area. Right. And young couples used to drive around there. Um, there were legends that it was haunted, that sort of thing. And that's where they were when they all saw it. And um, she's done several TV shows where, in fairly recent times, where she's um, told her story. You know, it's very compelling. It's hard to imagine that um, anybody would have made such a thing up. But the interesting thing is that when they saw it, it frightened um, the four young people, and they took off. Um, you know, Roger Scarberry hit, hit the gas and, and turned around, but the creature did not stay in that munitions dump. It began to just fly along right after them, keeping up with the automobile. And he said, Roger said that he was going up to 100 miles an hour at times, and it was still chasing them and emitting, emitting these ear-splitting shrieks. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, uh, now, also, there was reports of UFOs in this area as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right, right. That's what John Keel was saying. And, um, he, you know, if you, if you read his work on that subject... Um, he seems really as impressed by the fact that there were n great numbers of UFOs and that these men in black were uh, walking around the community and that um, he felt that he was being shadowed and tailed and um, maybe to some extent harassed a little bit himself, you know, just for being there and uh, looking into it. Now, now, what about the disaster with the bridge? Yeah, that's one of the scariest things. Um, the Silver Bridge crosses the Ohio at Point Pleasant, the Ohio River, and it was caused by um, a supporting I-bar pin, and it happened at 5 p.m. on December 15, 1967, which was a time when there was lots of uh, people coming home from work, so it had a full load. Uh, it was rush hour, and it just, everything just plunged right in. Um, 46 people died in this incident, and many people felt, uh, since there was a um, sighting very very shortly before that, many people felt that perhaps the Mothman was, again, some sort of harbinger of doom sent ahead by some unknown force to warn people, or maybe that it was just somehow... Um, attracted by the impending death and showed nobody really knows why such a thing would show up. But um, many people have suggested that there's a connection between the Mothman and this terrible disaster. Uh, yeah, I, I, and another, this is another monster um, that is um, related to impending death or, or tragedies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there anything else you can say about the Mothman for the viewers? Well, um, there is a wonderful festival there <laughs> every year in case anybody, is, in, I believe it's in September, in case anybody's interested in going and really seeing and learning a lot about it, where they have speakers and there's a museum and all that sort of thing. So um, whatever the Mothman was, it's been really memorialized. There's a big statue of it in Point Pleasant. 
I think that it's probably uh, changed the town in some ways when you bring in, you know, great numbers of people once every year like that, and uh, you become known for this legend. It it kind of can't help but change how this uh, place is viewed. And uh, Keel also added that he knew of other Mothman-like sightings that were unreported by the press that continued through 1969 and that sometimes other similar things are seen in the same areas perhaps to this day they just don't get as much notoriety as the original ones did oh oh really but they but they are still getting um sightings reports of sightings um similar things uh to it you know and you you can't say well this is definitely a moth matter that isn't but um, you know, weird flying things, I guess, are still being seen in, in the area, so. Well, wow, that's very interesting. Um, are they still being uh, plagued by these men uh, men in black? Do, do you know? Um, you know that, well, that I don't know, you know, and the, the main person that reported those was John Keel, and, of course, he's passed away a, a few years ago now. Um, but there were things... Um, you know, that looked like other sorts of flying things, things that resembled giant owls, things that, uh, you know, were just um, sort of variations. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so let's move on then to, um, well, it, man, now man bat. Man bat, uh, bat squatch, giant flying bats, are they all the same, Linda? They have a lot of similarities. Um, they are, some people might consider them not all that different from Mothman because they have in general furry humanoid bodies and then very large bat-like or leathery wings that can be snapped out from behind them and, and uh, sometimes they're often said to sail away. If, if you remember we were talking about how um, the the bloth man was able to sail straight up away from the car and emitted this horrible screech. Mm -hmm. Well, very much the same thing happened. I'll talk about Wisconsin's man bat first. Okay. This was a case that I investigated myself in 2006, a couple weeks after I was contacted by the witness who, um, and it was only a couple of weeks earlier that this had happened. It was the evening of September 26th, about 9.30 p.m., and a middle-aged man and his 20-something-year-old uh, son were driving home from a band rehearsal in the city of La Crosse to their more rural home in Holman. And they were driving up a hill um, kind of a, in a rural area called Briggs Road, and they were just kind of cresting the hill when this thing came right at their windshield. Thought it w they both thought it was going to hit them and just smash right in. And yet only seconds before it hit, it sailed straight up and emitted one of those piercing shrieks. And at the sound of that shriek, and you know, maybe the shock of the incident had a little something to do with it too, but they both became immediately ill. And in fact, the son who was driving had to pull over and throw up in the ditch. Oh, my gosh. Um, the father was, the father who had some uh, health issues as it was, um, was sick for several weeks. And the creature, they didn't see it again, but they felt that it was, perhaps it followed them home, and they would have um, periods of time where there would be strange knockings on the walls of their house. Their dogs would be cowering inside. And they just had a feeling, um, especially the, the older man, that it might still be around. And I did receive similar sightings of a creature that sounded very much the same from a couple of other people in the La Crosse area. So it wasn't like a just a, a one-off um, in, incident. And the two people that also had run-ins with the creature their incidents happened a year before well holly so it could not have and that was the man uh the man was a, a part native american and that's yeah. the name that he went by well holly uh, and one of these incidents was on french island um 
which is a, actually an island uh, that you have to go over a bridge to get to. And that was in 2005. And a friend of his um, saw one on his backyard, uh, on, the, on the backyard playset that belonged to his children when he was out having a cigarette and saw something gigantic swoop into this tree. And, and he also saw it flap over to um, his garage, ran along the roof, and then launched itself from the roof into the darkness. Oh, my gosh. Now, is there any reports of this uh, bat squatch doing any harm to anybody? Not in this case, you know, not in La Crosse. Um, it just seemed to really frighten people, you know, and they wondered if it was trying to get at something. Um, you know, why would it be dive bombing a vehicle? But um, there, there wasn't any anything really there. There was sort of an interesting coincidence. I don't have any evidence that the uh, the uh, man bat did this, but when I went to investigate the sighting area, we were driving up Briggs Road, and we got to the spot where they had the incident. Mm -hmm. And he pointed over the, in the direction of a nearby tree line and said, well, that was where it flew to. We, we saw it fly to there, those trees, after uh, it almost hit the car and then we lost sight of it. So we pulled over there and went and had a look and believe it or not, right at the exact spot was part of a deer carcass that had been evidently dropped right in there. Uh, there were no drag marks, the grass wasn't broken around it. And just certain parts of the deer, some of the haunches were, were taken, it was partially skinned back, the skin was pulled partly back, but a lot of what people would usually think of as, you know, the more trace cuts were left right on it. Um, it's very possible and pro I think probably likely that this was more of a case of human poaching because uh, there was a garbage bag under it and there was a gun club not very far away from that area. But I just thought it was uh, it, it had, and it had been there for a while. Mm -hmm. The temperatures were cold enough that year that it could easily have been preserved for some time. So it's possible that um, it had been there the night of the sighting and the creature was just attracted to it, knew it was there, and disappeared in those trees to have a look at this uh, candy carcass that was lying there. But there was no trace of blood. No, there was no blood anywhere around, no drag marks. That's it was, like I said, just, just like it had been dropped down in there. So how many sightings have they had of this uh, bat squatch? Well, um, you mean in La Crosse? Well, or? it's been in other areas as well, hasn't it, Linda? Right, exactly, yeah. In La Crosse, I had three, possibly four witnesses, and there may have been more that I don't know about, but... Um, Long before that, over in Tacoma, Washington, uh, there were sightings. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll just say real quickly that um, this, this thing has been sighted all over the country, and there are quite a few sightings. But it first came to the, uh, the attention of the public in an article published in April 1994 in the Tacoma, Washington News Tribune. And I managed to uh, track down the original reporter, his name was C.R. Roberts, and who still writes for the paper. And he's the one who interviewed the very first witness, an 18-year-old named Brian Canfield. And he's the one who first called it the Bat Squatch. And he had, a, again, a nighttime encounter with a winged creature that he thought was at least nine years old. And again, it was 9.30 p.m. Um, in the evening, and this time he was driving a truck whose engine failed. So the car just stopped right there in the middle of the road, and then suddenly he sees this big thing coming down out of the dark sky right at him onto the dirt road where it landed hard enough that this cloud of dust was raised. Mm. And... Yeah, and he said in the paper, according to um, the reporter, Roberts, it was standing there staring at me like it was rusting, like it didn't know what to think. I was sc 
scared. It raised the hair on me. I didn't feel threatened. I just felt out of place. And Robert was able to interview him soon after, just the same as, as I was able to with the lacrosse one. And he told me that uh, when, I, when I called him, the reporter, that he thought the boy was absolutely telling what he believed to be the complete truth and that he cross-interviewed him and performed background checks, uh, which is, you know, what I always try and do with these witnesses. And uh, everybody that he talked to had only positive things to say about this teenager and that he believed him. Oh, interesting. Wow. Um, now, Linda, do you go out and investigate? When, uh, so how do these people contact you? Through your website? When, when they see a, when there's been a sighting? Yeah, um, these days, you know, I mean, ever since um, people began to have websites, I know I had, uh, my first website was, was uh, actually not devoted just to strange things, but to all kinds of different, just unusual things, folk art and um, odd people and, and that sort of thing. It was called cnbscene.com. And... That website uh, soon became a conduit for people to write me and uh, tell me about um, their sites, or they would find my email. But, of course, remember, this had been going on with me for, um, you know, a decade before that, back to, back to 1992. And now, of course, it's, as I said earlier, it's very, very easy for people to find me on Facebook or um, go to lindagodfrey.com, which is my main blog site now that also has report forms and um, information about my books and, and that kind of thing. So um, most sightings that I get these days come from my lindagodfrey.com website or Facebook um, or or, uh, or even Twitter. People have reached me on that, mm-hmm. too. Wow. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so the last one for tonight is Flying Dragons. Yeah, this is, um, I mean, people think, well, dragons, that's something from the Middle Ages or China or um, other other places that don't have anything to do with modern people. However, um, you know, and, and I wrote my book, it seems really unlikely that these kinds of things could be out and about. Um, to me, they, they often sound as much like what you might think of as a gargoyle. Um, a little bit differently designed sort of creature than what you think of as a medieval dragon. Um, but in general, they have, they're, they're depicted as having scales and wings. Um, they can fly. Um, they don't have the furry creature in the middle. They have more of a reptilian-looking thing in the middle. And I've had actually some people from Wisconsin who've reported these things to me. And uh, sometimes they have sort of a kangaroo body shape. Um, one came from a woman named Lori Little in Toma, Wisconsin. And for some reason, these weird wind things seem to uh, like to show up about half past the hour of 9 in the evening because her sighting also appeared at 9.40 p.m. Mm. And she heard a dog barking outside, and she saw a, a creature that looked very similar to a kangaroo only four and a half feet tall. This one wasn't so large. And it had uh, shining yellow eyes, um, small arms. Um, this one was a little more like a deer. I, sh- I shouldn't say that all of them look like reptilians because this one wasn't exactly. But she said it wasn't a deer, it wasn't a dog, it wasn't a goat or anything she could think of. And it was in her yard. And it disappeared. She went in to get a flashlight or something and it was gone when she came back. Um, in Van Meter, Iowa, my friend Chad Lewis Noavaz and Kevin Nelson discovered uh, the old story of something called the Van Meter Visitor when this giant bat-like thing kind of invaded this town in Iowa in 1903 and terrified everybody in the downtown. It was hanging out in the downtown area after crawling out of an old mine shaft. Oh, my God. And this thing was described as half human and half animal with large membranous wings and a, a blunted 
horn growing out of its forehead. And that actually, the horns were another feature that some people described as belonging to the Jersey Devil. Not always, but um, sometimes, um, especially some of the newer sightings. So that's another variable that you have on these things. And it eventually was seen uh, disappearing into the, the mine shaft and then leaving town with what looked like a mate. There were two of them. So that was particularly scary. Um, I also had uh, a family, a mother, a daughter, and a son who all saw uh, what they described as dragons because they couldn't come up with any other term for them uh, in the small town of Oconto Falls. It's not very far from Green Bay. And it's a very small town, as I said. So everybody knows everyone else. And um, the son had been to a concert and had walked back home with his friends, and they were lying out on um, on top of some cars and some and some uh, lawn areas, looking at the sky, when they saw several creatures. There was one large one and several smaller ones that they couldn't see as well, and they looked like dragons. They said they were making gliding movements up and down, never flapping their wings. Um, they were cream-colored. Um, they had scales that they could see by moonlight and by the street lights. They were low enough that the, the street lights were gleaming on them and showing scale a scale like coverings. Their the head was snake shaped, as they said. And uh, the daughter wrote me a very long description of her own. And she said, I don't care what scientists say, it was not a pterodactyl. It had pearly pale scales. And she felt that um, she saw a fire or a fireball of some type coming from its mouth. Oh, no. And she was so uneasy. She said, I went indoors because my heart told me, no, you aren't supposed to be watching this. Oh, my God. Do you think some of these are supernatural? Well, you know, Noreen, I don't know exactly what to think. Um, some of the witnesses will say that. And I, I really try to give the witness report and pass on what they felt. And in this case, um, I, think that the, I think that the daughter sort of felt that they might have been, um, it just depends on the witness. Some people feel they're seeing an actual living creature that maybe, you know, came out of a cave or lives somewhere else. Um, and other people think that they're seeing something from another world that somehow yeah. found a way into our world and is just passing through. Yeah, you know, I and I, I don't, I don't really know myself. Because, I mean, some of these creatures they've found footprints, but there's never any bodies, Linda. Why aren't there ever any bodies? Right, and and that's the general question people ask that about Bigfoot. They ask it about the dog man. Uh, we have these giant birds, the thunderbirds, the giant uh, giant raptors, giant stork-like things, um, the Jersey Devil. I mean, certainly if you found a dead something with the body of a kangaroo but wings and horse's hoofs and uh, horns, you know, and you found a dead one of those, you would know you had something really unusual. And the fact that people don't find these things that are dead um, really just increases the mystery for me. Um, if it's, if they're in fact just spirit things or hallucinations or um, misidentifications, they should vary even more widely than they do. You know, I mean, people should, you know, there shouldn't be any rhyme or reason. And yet they, they resemble one another um, in each grouping just enough that you can usually make a category out of them and and um, at least make sort of an educated guess as to which group they belong to, you know, so there, there's some rhyme or reason, mm -hmm. but yet, right, right, they don't show up as, as dead bodies, and... Um, no, Linda, and people, people, uh -huh. people take hikes, they're always in the uh -huh. woods, they have their cell phone with them, which takes pictures now, in uh -huh. the old days that didn't happen, it's just, there's, there's no... Um, there's not a lot of well i don't think there's any real pictures are there of the jersey devil and and there are sketches but not real right. pictures you get you get witness sketches but um well particularly in older times you wouldn't expect a picture because it took so long to 
set up the enormous equipment that was needed, and whatever was in it had to sit really still, you know, for for a, some time to have the uh, the long exposures that were required to take pictures back in the 1900s in those days. Um, but then these days, people do have cell phones. It still though takes long enough to put the the cell phone into camera mode, aim it, put it up, and then hope you can catch the creature before it leaves sight. Most sightings of any of these unknown creatures last only a few seconds. They're really random. They're unexpected by people. Um, oftentimes they're at night and the illumination is the illumination is not sufficient to capture it. So, you know, I can understand why we don't have good pictures. It is harder to understand why you don't find the bodies. And that's a question that um, some people believe can best be answered by the, their idea that these go back and forth between worlds. Um, you know, some people claim to have actually seen portals where things are flying out or they, they look in the sky and it looks like there's a hole that opens into a completely different landscape. I know some people who say they have seen these things. So either you have a lot of people seeing things that aren't really there or um, hallucinating, which I don't think is possible for, su for such a large number of reports of all of these things as we have, um, or there's some phenomenon we just really don't understand. And is there any uh, reports of any new monsters that uh, isn't out in the public, widely in the public lately? Well, um, at the very end of the flying chapter, I, I felt obligated to mention one that um, is, is just very odd. Nobody understands it, but uh, there seem to be quite a few sightings over towards Ohio and Pennsylvania. Uh, Lon Strickler with Monsters, uh, Phantoms and Monsters uh, website seems to be um, the, the central location for people reporting this one. They're called giant manta rays, and nobody really knows what to think of them because um, all of a sudden people are reporting seeing these big creatures that look like, just like stingrays or manta rays, oh except they're flying over land or they're flying way over the ocean, whereas, well, true manta rays can grow to be uh, quite large. They only just skip over the waves, maybe three feet above them. They don't totally leave the water and fly for long distances. So this is one that a lot of cryptozoologists are just sort of keeping an eye on. They don't really know exactly what is going to come of it or what they are or how to explain them. And, um, you know, it just, it takes a sort of curious mind to remain interested in these things. You know, it, it takes someone with um, sort of a passion for the unknown and just remaining curious as to why people keep seeing these particular sorts of creatures and, um, you know, hoping, as I do, that maybe someday we'll, we'll figure out the rhyme and the reason behind them. Yeah, yeah. It's just that uh, uh, if you turn, every time you turn around, there seems to be a new um, monster that's being cited, and it just keeps getting more and more every year, it seems like, and it, the list is growing and I, well, and again, you have to remember there are a lot more places now that you can report them. There are many more people aware of the, this fact, and also um, there are a lot of people who have been sitting on or holding their sightings within them for many, many years, who now finally have an outlet. An outlet, excuse me. Um, a lot of the sightings that I receive are not just two or three days ago. Um, a, a lot of times people will say, this happened to me 10 years ago or 20 years ago. I just never knew there was any place to go with it. I didn't know if anybody would want to hear about it. I was sure that people would think I was crazy. Um, but once they find out that there, there are people like me or um, many of these other uh, people who are interested in unknown animals collecting the encounters and trying to sort them out and make some sort of database, then they feel validated and like it's okay to come forward and speak their piece. And uh, people will often say to me, I'm just so glad 
to talk to someone who doesn't think I'm crazy for having <laughs> seen this thing. Yeah, I can understand that. <laughs> Linda, thanks so much for being on the show tonight. <clears throat> now, Linda. You're welcome. You're going to come back. You, you told me you would come back because I'm going to have Linda back on two more times. Uh, we're going to do, uh, we're going to air a show on Monsters by Land. And what was the other one, Linda? Monsters by Water? Right. By, yeah. By, by, uh, by air, by sea, and by land. Right. And Monsters by Sea. So the next time, it'll be next year because I'm already full for this year. But next year, I'll have you come back and we'll do Monsters by sure. Land. I'm excited about that. Linda, now I'm going to show them your book. And let me put your book up. And mm -hmm. you can tell them. Oh, come on. Whoops. Where they can get this book. Hold on for a second. Oh, where is it? Here it is. Here it is. Here's your book. Linda, I've got your picture and your book, your latest book up. So Thank give... you. Thank you. Yeah, and it's very widely available. Um, you know, just about any book vendor will have both a paperback, paperback and, and you can also get it as an e-book. And um, you can go to lindagodfrey.com uh, to see all my books and for more information. And that's also the address of my uh, my blog. That's awesome. Linda, thank you so much. Um, again, it was well, it was a pleasure to have you on the show, and I really appreciate you taking out your time to be on my show. I love having you. And uh, have a great holiday Halloween, which is all our favorites, and uh, happy holidays to you, and uh, I'll, I'll see you next year, huh? Thanks, and thanks to all your listeners, too. Thanks, Linda. Good night. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Okay.